Well, I encourage you to grab your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6 as we continue our study in the book of Ephesians called The Mystery of Christ. Uh, Really in this time, we're continuing to work our way through Paul's instructions for spirit-filled Christians in particular relationships. These final chapters of the book are what Spurgeon affectionately called the whole system of gospel morals. And really, we we find our theme that has guided us since the previous chapter, where Paul said in chapter 5, verse 21, we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so this is why, from verse 22, back in chapter 5, all the way to verse 9 here in chapter 6, The apostle has been instructing believers in how to conduct themselves in particular relationships. That as spirit-filled Christians, we may faithfully and obediently follow God's direction and his design. And so in this, Paul has been focusing on relationships within the home. In fact, previously we would looked at the instructions given to husbands and wives and also parents and children. But as we look at verses 5 through 9 this morning, he is not yet done talking about the home. And I will say, this is likely the most odd and difficult exposition for us to understand today. But of course, that doesn't mean that we skip over this text or we, or we gloss over it as though it's irrelevant to us. But as God's word is always true and applicable and living and active, these verses remain in God's word to show us how one is to serve and manage in a way that brings glory and honor to God. And so here as we go to our text, we need to be careful first to understand this text within the original context. See, Paul knew that these bond servants were considered part of the family in that culture. And so it was with great care and intention, as we'll see, that he addresses believing masters and slaves, where really he gave them great gospel instructions in how to serve and lead as unto the Lord. And so in that, what we're going to learn in our exposition this morning of verses 5 through 9 is that a slave must obey sincerely as to the Lord himself and masters must do the same. And so we're going to go and read Ephesians 6 verses 5 through 9. And so hear the word of the Lord. Bondservants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. And may God bless the reading of his holy word. Now, as we go to examine these verses this morning, it's important that we clearly understand Paul is not promoting the system of slavery. Paul is promoting a godly approach to working relationships in the context of his culture. And so remember first that he is addressing believers in the assembly. Again, as he said back in chapter 1, verse 1, these are saints who are faithful in Christ Jesus. And so within the context of the home... Paul is giving them godly instructions regarding their relationships with one another in the Lord. See, in Paul's day, we need to understand that slavery was interwoven into the fabric of their society. It was institutional and it was legal under Roman law. In fact, to give you an idea of how extensive 
slavery was, historians estimate that one-third of those in Ephesus were slaves. And most of them worked in agricultural contexts, and so they were crucial to the stability of that society. Uh, Economic stability depended upon them. The food supply depended upon them. And so often you had all kinds of slaves. Uh, This is why, in fact, the ESV uses the term bondservant. In fact, if you read the interpreter's notes, you find that they're not trying to get away from the understanding of the historical context in Paul's language about slaves, but they're trying to help us understand how broad this term is. Because in Paul's day, slaves would become slaves for a number of reasons. Uh, Some would become slaves through military conquest, and others even would become slaves through economic hardship, uh, where they would really sell themselves into slavery for a time so that they could make ends meet. And so when Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, He knew that there would certainly be slaves and masters within the congregation. And he knew that these bondservants, as they are called in the ESV, were considered part of the family in that culture. Now, I think what is so difficult for us to understand in the context here is when we consider this against the backdrop of our own nation's history regarding slavery. And some of the mistreatments that we are aware of in that history of certain people. And so I want you to understand. In fact, I want you to be sure to know Paul's words do not in any way apply to that form of slavery, even if it is found in his day. He is not talking about an illegal, purely exploitive, sinful and unjust slavery to masters. And so in no way, as we come to this text, do we need to think that Paul says to that kind of slave, a slave who's been exploited and trafficked illegally, that they should just obey. That they should just not question really their master and and don't seek freedom, just fall in line. No, remember that Paul's instructions here are to believing slaves and believing masters. And again, I think that's difficult for us to understand. But we see the example of the apostle's approach to slaves and masters in his day, particularly in the book of Philemon. Paul wrote to a man named Philemon, who in fact was a rich master of slaves. See, in the book of Philemon, we find that one of Philemon's slaves was Onesimus. And he was one who fled from Roman persecution and later became a believer and a help to Paul. And so Paul wrote to Philemon in verse 15 and 16 about sending this slave back to his master. And Paul asked him that he might be back to him forever. In verse 16 saying, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And so I want you to understand, as we consider Paul's instructions for Christian masters and bondservants, we should notice that he neither condemns all slavery in his own culture, neither does he condone slavery as an institution to be desired. Instead, what we see is that the apostle simply addresses slavery as a matter of fact. And in that, he gives godly instructions to Christian slaves and masters. And why? Why does he do this? Well, it's so that, as he said, they may walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which they have been called. called, Even within the context of this undesirable institution. And so the apostles' instructions for slaves and masters is not to promote or to approve slavery itself, but to powerfully promote gospel morals in believers that are slaves and masters. So this is why Paul says in verse 5, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, 
with a sincere, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Now it's interesting that as we look at the example of Philemon, we find instructions for a very different approach than our world. Again, even if we look at our nation's own history, it is plagued with terrible evil and sin regarding slavery and the mistreatment of certain people. And even today, our world still has made a mess of trying to fix that, of trying to eradicate that. In fact, you may know that if today you're not woke or a proponent of critical race theory or intersectionality, then you're just automatically assumed to hate people of color, to hate the idea to abolish slavery, and really the assumption is that then you hate anyone that differs from you. But again, Paul's instruction is not to sinfully oppress slaves with evil and ungodly masters. We need to remember that all through these relational instructions that Paul has been given, just as a believing wife is not called to submit to a sinfully abusive husband calling her to contradict her obedience to the Lord, and even a believing child is not called to obey a sinfully abusive parent that's calling them to contradict their obedience to the Lord, so also a slave in Paul's day was not to obey their earthly masters if the instruction was a contradiction to their heavenly master. But again here, Paul calls believing slaves to obey, to obey their earthly masters with what? With a sincere heart as they would Christ. Now see, this was a radically different approach in Paul's day regarding these relationships. But he's ultimately calling for sincere obedience as unto the Lord. Now understand, because of this Christian approach, what Paul taught concerning the relationship between masters and bondservants actually contributed positively to the eventual ratification of the ancient slavery system. In fact, historians agree that Christianity and its teaching greatly influenced the abolition of slavery. And so we need to remember that Paul was dealing with an immediate cultural reality. And in the midst of that, he's calling believers to live counter-cultural. See, Paul was ultimately concerned here with the Christian's witness, how they conducted themselves in the world and in the workplace. As Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, verse 1 in the New King James Version, let as many bondservants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. Church, we need to remember that the aim of the church is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to sinners. And so that means that our own work should be part of our witness. This is part of Paul's concern in relationships in the home. And so this is why even in an undesirable context such as slavery, Paul is calling the believing slave to obey their earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as they would Christ. Now again, to zoom out almost from the immediate context of slavery in Paul's day, some bond servants there were servants by choice and common vocation. Not all, but some. And so there is, in a sense, an application here in regards to our work and our employment to our employers. And so let me ask you, do you approach your work as unto Christ? And do you do it with a sincere heart? See, just as with wives and children, Paul is not calling us to obey if or when our earthly masters, our, our, our employers decide to obey Christ. We are to honor them and serve as unto Christ 
regardless if they do. In verse 6, Paul continues by saying that bondservants must obey not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Now see, this is a call to view work through the lens of our submission to the authority and headship of Christ. Did you know that as we are in Christ, we are called bondservants of Christ. We're slaves to the Lord Jesus. In fact, often if not always, the apostles begin their letters by stating that they are bondservants of Christ. Romans 1, James 1, 2 Peter 1, and Jude 1 are just a few examples of how the apostles communicate that their ultimate submission, their ultimate slavery is to their master and king, Jesus. See, this was a way of telling the church that even if we are restrained or imprisoned or governed by earthly masters, ultimately, we are slaves of Christ above all others. And so in our service and in our work, we are not seeking to please man but to do the will of God. See, this is the result of a genuine heart that has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so even when we are in undesirable circumstances and positions, knowing that our work is under the Lord should motivate us to please God and not man. In fact, this is why in verse 7, Paul says bondservants are to be rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Now, I've mentioned many times how uh, Colossians 3 uh, is really a parallel passage to Paul's instructions here in chapters 4 through 6. But in verse 23 of Colossians 3, Paul says it this way. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Now, it's interesting when when the ESV says work heartily, many other translations say do it from the heart. Now, again, remember last week when we looked at the first four verses pertaining to children and parents, we learned that while obedience is a call to certain behaviors, Honor is an issue that exposes our heart's condition. See, obedience and honor are things that only the Christian can rightly and freely do. And so we need to remember that when God saves rebels like us, he gives us a new heart that's filled with life and joy, which is then pleased to honor and obey even earthly authorities in the Lord. And so when we render service to earthly authorities, whatever they may be in our life, we need to do so, as Paul says, as unto Christ, remembering that he is our ultimate authority. Now understand, for the Christian who is under the submission of Christ, this is both a covering and a command. See, first it covers us from obeying anything or anyone that would tell us to obey in ways that absolutely dishonor Christ and his authority. But remember, the apostles came across this issue in Acts chapter 5, where the, where the earthly authorities called them to obey in the way of stop proclaiming the gospel. And their answer in verse 29 was to say, we must obey God rather than men. And so Christ, as our ultimate authority, covers us, but it also commands us not to overthrow those authorities, but to obey them as far as we are able, to render service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. And so really, even today, we are confronted with the question, what does our work say about the condition of our heart? What does our service say? in the workplace, reveal about our obedience to God's word. Again, friends, if you are begrudgingly obeying the earthly authorities in your life, and you're only doing it to please man, to complete the task, to get them off your back, then ultimately you're not honoring the Lord in your work. 
But again, as Christ has come, and he has served in the greatest way by becoming a servant unto death and giving his life for the sins of God's elect, then we are also called to submit to Christ and serve those God has placed over us in this life. Friends, did you know that that is in fact an incredible way you have been given an opportunity to proclaim the gospel? Then in your work, it would point them to who you truly worship and work for. See, again, the heart of the issue is that Paul is telling bondservants they are to obey, not superficially, but sincerely from the heart. They are to serve their masters faithfully in a, in a way that reflects godly character. In fact, think of the example we find back in the book of Genesis in Joseph. Think of the way that Joseph served in Potiphar's house and also even in prison. That he was faithful to his master, even though the circumstances that brought him to Egypt were unjust. And think of how he served his master, not only when he was looking, but even when his master was away. See, this is the way that a Christian bondservant was to serve. Joseph would have and really should have been a great example to them that sincerely and from the heart they were to be rendering service with a good will as to the Lord. And even going back, this is also how children and wives and citizens were to honor the authority that was over them with a sincere heart. Now see, in this, Paul tells us that as we are to serve with a sincere heart, in verse 8, he further tells us that there is actually an ultimate blessing that comes to those who genuinely obey and serve as to the Lord. He says in verse 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Now, I want you to remember, this is not a motivation from the apostle to earn a right standing before God. That if you obey the right way or you do things the right way, then you will be seen as good in God's eyes. No, the only good in us is Christ. And so Paul's not contending for salvation by works, but he's contending for a godly work of those who are saved. He's saying that which comes out of our heart in service as believers is to bring forth life and not death and harm. See, friends, every single person will stand before Christ on that day when he returns. And they will give an answer for the good or the evil that they have done. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now see, in our text, Paul is focused on the good outcome for those who are in Christ. Because for those who are in Christ, whatever good they do as unto the Lord, this they will receive back from the Lord. Now remember, church, this is a call to actually die to ourselves and live in Christ. So it's not that we obey in order to get blessings. We obey because Christ has changed our hearts. And as we follow him and as we live in him, we're motivated to do good as though we are doing good to him. Now again, as we seek to understand this, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16 where we see Jesus instructing in this important truth. In verses 24 through 27. In Matthew 16, starting in verse 24, Matthew writes, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Now again, church, remember, ultimately our greatest reward is the Lord himself. If we are in Christ, we have received the greatest good our heart and soul needs. And so we're called to serve, even as bond servants are here, and to do good knowing that God will repay that. See, Paul is saying here that a real servant is someone who works to please God. They've died to themselves. They, they've picked up their cross. They're not seeking to please man, but to please the Lord. And so if you're going to please the Lord, it doesn't matter whether that authority is present or not. God is looking at the heart. That is what should motivate our work. Not how man assesses our physical labors, but how God assesses our hearts. See, church, even though we are not bond servants, and again, I think we must be so careful to know the difference between the context of the first audience and us today. Still, we are expected as Christians to be people of integrity. We are called in dying to ourselves, to lay aside anything of the flesh and walk in Christ. And so we're called to do a full day's work, whether a boss or employer is looking or not. And so really, this is a call to gospel instructions in our daily lives. And even notice that Paul doesn't just address the slaves in the, in the assembly, Paul also speaks to masters. In verse 9 of our text, Paul says, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Now again, I think this is another aspect of why this text is so difficult. There are not masters in our culture today. There is none of us in here that that are in the same context of the masters that Paul is speaking to. There is very terrible slavery around our world still today. But again, we need to look at this through the lens of the first audience. In fact, this is why I think Philemon is a great example to us in what it means for a master to do these same things to their slaves as a believer. Uh, Again, turn with me to the book of Philemon and we'll look at verse 4 through 7 together. Because there in the book of Philemon, Paul is speaking to Philemon about his godly character. In verses 4 through 7, Paul says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Verse 6, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. In verse 7, he says, for I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. See, Paul is calling for this kind of love and character in earthly masters that he is affirming in Philemon. He wanted masters to serve bondservants in the love of Christ as they honor those slaves who are created in the image of God. Now again, I do not feel it can be overstated that no one here is a master in the sense that Paul is using the term, as Paul is addressing that audience. But again, anyone who has any kind of authority can learn from what Paul says to masters. See, just as Paul addresses the heart of those servants that he called to obey, 
In the same way here, he addresses the heart of the masters when he says, and stop your threatening. He's really getting the heart of how they must conduct themselves. That those in authority should never have an oppressive or harsh or condescending attitude toward their servants. Rather, believing masters should love their servants with the love of Christ. And again, just as Paul urged the bondservants to obey their masters as to the Lord, he also urges masters to treat their servants as equals, being mindful of God who is in heaven. That these masters were to do the same to them and stop their threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality in him. See, every human authority must wield their power with the heart of a servant. That is completely countercultural to our day, just as it was in Paul's day. But in love, they are to be mindful that they themselves are under God's authority. A church never forget that God is our ultimate authority. He is not unaware or absent in any injustice or wicked authorities. He hears the cries of those who are truly oppressed. And he will surely pour out his wrath on oppressors. And so as Paul resolves on the instructions for godly households, he is reminding masters that the greatest authority is God himself. In fact, we see this in verse 9. When Paul says that God in heaven is both their master and yours, and there is no partiality in him. Again, we need to remember that Paul is writing this to the churches of his day. Again, there would have been slaves and masters in the congregation who would hear this instruction. And really, Paul's words back in chapter 4, I think, greatly influence the driving motivation in some of these instructions. Uh, Often we think of chapter 5, verse 21 as really the theme, but I think the driving motivation in Paul's instruction here comes from Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 3, where he told the church, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. See, that is why Paul has now given us these instructions for Spirit-filled Christians in these particular relationships in the home. He's calling us, even as he did his first hearers, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. And in these particular relationships, he's calling us to follow God's design. That as we approach one another, we would do so with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And why? What's Paul's ultimate desire and goal for the church? Well, really, that they would be set apart from the world that they wouldn't be walking in the ways of the world, but in the ways of the word. That while the world is filled with evil and selfishness, the church is to have an eagerness to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And so again, as you already know, this world is very, very divided. And that is not something that's new. It's, in fact, very comical how often we talk about things as though they're new, that that there are new things coming in the world, new terrors, new problems. No, they're just old problems repainted. We're just more technologically advanced, so you're further aware of the problems the Bible has already made us aware of. Again, as the book of Ecclesiastes would tell us, there's nothing new under the sun. And so sinners are going to sin And the world is very divided. The the world is divided on race, on class, on status, and on gender. And I think one of the biggest problems through the pandemic is how selfish we have become, even in the church. 
And so as we've seen many times today, our world is backwards and upside down when it comes to relationships in the home and in the workplace. Again, we need to understand that in Christ, we are united together as one. No matter what happens when we walk outside these doors and we walk into our workplace and we see what's happening in the landscape of our society, we need to remember this important gospel truth that we are together in Christ united. That we are all made in God's image. That we are sinners saved by grace, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so that means black and white, male and female, rich and poor, slave and free, stand equal together in Christ. Again, this is Paul's exact point in Galatians 3 when he says in verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is why the Christian cannot seek to to reach the world with the world's methods. We don't need to get more woke. We need the word. We need to be reminded of these biblical truths. Because in the church, so far as it is biblical, we actually get a picture of the glory of the new heavens and the new earth where people will stand in perfect unity from every tribe and language and people and nation. Because in that day, as Revelation 5 tells us, they will be a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Why? Because they are those who have been ransomed by the blood of the Lamb. And so today, the church is a picture of that future unity that will exist, that perfect unity that will exist in the new heavens and the new earth. And so this is because our our ultimate union is rooted not in the color of our skin or or in our gender or in our status, but in Christ. And so, yes, the the things that are divided in this world and that overwhelm us, those will melt away on the last day. And I think even today, we must work for them to melt away in our own lives. We must be not so concerned with the things of this world, but concerned to be eager for the unity of the Spirit in the church. Because remember, for the church, as it is displayed in local assemblies, Every believer is called to a godly approach in every relationship because the visible church is a display of the kingdom of God in this present evil age. It is a light to this dark and divided world to show it that in Christ there is unity and peace. And so as Paul has been showing us in these particular relationships how we are to conduct ourselves, he is really addressing the heart of the matter. That in areas where there are authorities over us, we are to submit out of reverence to Christ. And so church, understand in these instructions, even in ones like today, where it seems difficult to find the application because it's first to an early audience, We need to remember if we want the divisions and hate and oppression to be overcome in this world, then from a sincere heart, we need to seek to honor the Lord in these particular relationships. Again, as we began to walk through these things, I I told you that if, if really we want a society to succeed, then it begins in the home. And if we want a society to fail, we have to begin in the home. Really, this is Paul's point. Believers need to take very seriously these relationships between husbands and wives, between children and parents, between slaves and masters, employers and employees. And so again, we're reminded in all of this 
that we need not promote certain programs or agendas in our culture. We must proclaim with our lives God's design for the home in the gospel. That is what we need. And so really the question that Paul is almost leaving us with, or really the the call is to obey God's desire and design. So that is the question. Are we seeking to obey God's desire and design in these relationships? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in this time. And God, we ask that you would give us wisdom to discern how to go about uh, the relationships in our life. God, if we are uh, husbands, would you teach us to love? For wives, would you teach them to submit? Lord, for children, would you teach them to obey? Parents, to raise their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And Lord, for us in the context of today, would you teach us to honor and to obey our our earthly authorities that are employers in a way that is unto you. Lord, I know some here are in undesirable circumstances in their vocation. And so God, I, I do not ask that you remove them from the circumstance, but Lord, I pray that you would give them joy in the midst of that. Lord, help them to be a light in the darkness of their vocation. Lord, help us to see how your church is a hope and a light in the midst of these relationships. Lord, help us to be a church that is eager to maintain unity. Lord, may that be a motivation that causes us to not only encourage one another, but hold one another accountable And so, God, we pray that as we go out from here, would you continue to remind us that our work and our witness is to be as unto you. Lord, we thank you again for your word and for the opportunity to spend this time together. Lord, would you continue to apply these truths to our minds and our hearts this week? Lord, as we continue now in our service by being privileged to take the Lord's Supper, would you remind us that this is an ordinance given by you through grace. God, we give you great thanks and we pray and ask that you would guide us not only through the rest of today, but throughout the rest of this week as we seek to be light. We pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.